in Matthew, we get this story about uh, Jesus and his encountering this Canaanite woman. Um, and the, the story is uh, about how Jesus' disciples push away this woman and won't let her in because Jesus is a Jew and the disciples are Jews and Jesus, the Messiah, came for the Jews. And this woman, this Canaanite woman, this Gentile, is not supposed to have anything to do with Jesus. And so Jesus says, no, 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 let her come in. And the story is about how uh, the Gentiles are welcome and should be brought in. Uh, I wanted to read to you something from Romans. Um, this, is a, this is a letter that Paul wrote. Paul is a Jew. He's the Jewiest Jew that ever Jewed, is what I like to say. Those are his words, not mine. Um, Paul asks, he says, he says to the Romans, he says, I ask you then, has God rejected his people, the Jews? By no means, says Paul. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Did you not read the scriptures about Elijah and how he pleads and God works for his people Israel? So just 25 years later, just a generation later, we go from what happened with uh, Jesus in the book of Matthew, how the Gentiles couldn't come in, to... Uh, Paul and him telling uh, all of the Gentiles, no, no, the Jews can come in. And the message was only for the Gentiles. It totally flip-flopped in just a generation. Uh, and, I, and I lift that up to you to show you, to remind you, to tell you that we are all really good at thinking that we are really good. And we think that we, the ones who are inside of the lines that we draw, are the best. And anybody outside the lines, thems, are really bad, and they should be exactly where they are, outside the lines. And today, in our society, I think it's even easier to come to those conclusions, because we can go online and we can find sources that tell us exactly what we want to hear. Uh, we can look at sources that, that don't have diverging opinions. We can watch news shows, and we can hang out with people that, that are all exactly like us, think like us, act like us, talk like us, are just basically other images of us. And we never get the outside and dissenting opinion. This is called an echo chamber, where you find yourself in a place where everybody says exactly what you want to hear, and you just hear only those things. This echo chamber can produce nasty, horrible things. And so I want to take a second and talk about some of the nasty, horrible things that have already been produced in our world. Last Saturday, I'm sure you've heard about what happened in Virginia and Charlottesville. Uh, this group called the alt-right, the, the national group, uh, nationalism, um, perpetrated some evil acts in the world. I don't want to mince words here, I want to be very clear. Before we go any further about uh, the alt-right and nationalism, I want to do a little history lesson here. I'm Sure, you all know this, but uh, we're going to go through it anyway. The National Socialistisch Deutsche Arbeiterparty, right? The National Socialistisch Deutsche Arbeiterparty. Okay, let's break that down. Deutsche, that's German. National Socialistisch, Socialistisch is nationalism. Okay, well, that, that's a big phrase there. National Socialistisch Deutsche Arbeiterpartei is really big, but maybe if we just use the first syllable, the first phrase, Nazi, Nazi. Sound familiar? The National Party, National Nazi Party. Yeah, this is the party that made the Nazis out of the Germans. The Nazi Party is the National Party. The Nazi Party was really good about othering people. I'm sure you know this history. This isn't anything I'm having to tell you now. So, but what I want you to hear, and let's get back to the alt-right and the nationalism that we find ourselves engaging with. I'm going to condemn that right now. Really big, clear, obvious terms. The alt-right has nothing to do with the Christian church. If you think the message of the alt-right and nationalism is copacetic with the message of Jesus then you're not paying attention or listening because the two are not compatible, not even close to compatible. 
But I do want to tell you that our Christian values are compatible with our society and our culture. It's a good thing in America that we have free speech. Free speech is important. If we don't have people with dissenting opinions who tell us things that maybe we don't want to hear, then we will find ourselves, all of us, in an echo chamber. And the only way we can get out of that echo chamber is if somebody tells us something that we don't want to hear and we engage with them and try to discern the truth. But I think it's important that we recognize that just because you have an opinion doesn't make you right. I think as an American, and I hope that you can join me with this, we all need to make a confession that we, as a society, have trouble with racism. We are a historically racist nation. You may not want to say that, you don't want to engage in that, you want to do that, but you know what, as Christians we recognize that we don't hide our weaknesses, we don't hide the sins, we don't hide those things, we bring them out, we name them, and we claim them, and we say we've done them so that we don't have to continue to do them, that we might be forgiven, that we might move on, and as a nation we might be better off if we all just admitted the fact that we're racist. It doesn't mean that we go out and we have to start burning crosses, but it does mean that we need to go and pay attention to how we act and are in the world. Now, I want to take a second. I want to talk about where this comes from. Because you can't know everybody in the entire world. You can know a lot of people in your world. You can know, every, you know all the people in maybe your society and your church. You could really try and do that. But, but look, if you're a woman in a dark alley with your child, and a guy comes up to you, you have seconds to figure out, is this guy coming at me, and is he going to hurt me? If he's going to hurt me, I need to run. I need to run now. I don't have time to interview him, ask him 20 questions, and figure out what kind of a plant if he would be if he were a plant. I need to go if this guy's going to hurt me. And the way we do that is with prejudice. As we look at him real close, real quick, real fast, what's he wearing? How's he acting? Is he with me? Is he part of my people? If he's with me, if he's part of my people, if he acts like the people that I know, then it's likely that he'll respect me because we're in the same group, and so he won't take advantage of me or hurt me. If he's not, then maybe he will hurt me. And I need to know that right away because if this is a life or death situation, I have seconds to do something about it. This is why we are prejudiced as human beings, and it, it can be a helpful thing. Especially if you need to get up and go right quick and fast and now. But just because it's helpful doesn't mean that it's always helpful. In fact, it can go awry. It can go really wrong. And look, there are bad people in this world who want to do us harm. That's why God made Marines. Our Bible reading today is all about how Jesus was telling the Pharisees how they have all these cultural norms. The washing the hands before they eat, it wasn't about being clean. It wasn't about being hygienic. It was because as, as a person, you probably touched somebody or something that was ritually unclean, ritually impure, like a woman or a Gentile. And if you had these, these religious cooties on you, you had to get them off. And the way that you got them off was with this rite of washing your hands. And so when Jesus didn't do this, the Pharisees got all up in arms and they were all kinds of mad. How come you're not going along with the flow? This is the way that we've said it. And Jesus' answer is, well, yeah, it's the way you've said it. Just because you said it doesn't mean that it's right. The disciples were all kinds of crazy about that. They're like, yes, yeah, get to the man. They don't know what's up. Because Jesus' whole point was God is what's important. And all these other things that we put in our life are secondary. All of them up to and including even the religious ones, like washing your hands and getting the religious cooties off of you. There's nothing wrong with it up until you decide that that's what separates, which is what was happening. The Pharisees looked at Jesus, they looked at his disciples, and they said, Aha! You're one of them. You're not on the inside, are you? You're not a Jew because you don't wash your hands in just the way right before you eat. And if you're not one of us, that means you're one of them. And if you're one of them, that means God must not love you. So, Jesus said, no, that's wrong. You're all kinds of wrong. The disciples were all kinds of excited. The fact that Jesus was with them. And now, enter a Canaanite woman. The real one of them. And what do the disciples do? They get all kinds of hypocritical. They push her out and they push her aside. They say, no, no, you don't want anything to do with this. God, you can't be here. This isn't for you. You know, you don't belong in this kind of a place. 
This is exactly like looking at somebody and saying, hey, your skin is the wrong color, you don't belong here. Or looking at someone's clothing and saying, hey, look, you don't, you don't have the right kind of clothing on, I know who you are and what you're all about. This is the exact evil that the alt-right perpetrates into the world. This is evil. I'm not talking like bad, I'm not talking like a not good decision, I'm talking like good and evil, I am authority on good and evil. This is evil. If you say that somebody is good or bad based on the color of their skin, that's evil. And when Christ said to the Pharisees that what they were doing about the washing of the hands, he was trying to let them know that it's not what you say, it's what you do. And what comes out of your heart, that's where the evil is. That's where the intention comes. So, so if, you, if you bear false witness, if you, uh, if you murder, if you're an adulterer, a fornicator, a thief, a slanderer, these are what defile you. And the alt-right, they don't even know what defiles. Because they get to make up their own definition. And now that they've made up their definition, they have no idea what good or bad is because they've decided. And as soon as it doesn't work for them, you know what they're going to do? They're going to tweak it just the right way so it works for them however they want. They are the them. And they are evil. Because it's not just the words. It's not just the words that come out of them that are evil. Those are. It's the intent that those words come from. Our president took a little flack in this last week because he didn't deny the attacks in Charlottesville as quickly as he should, and maybe he should have done it quicker. But, but look, if you're looking to President Trump as your moral authority, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> the president is not a pastor. Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. God is the one who made us. He gave us the manual. He said, this is how you should live. Don't look to President Trump for your moral guidance. It's not going to go well for you. <laughs> so I want to reinterpret this Bible verse for you. I like to do this every once in a while. I take a little liberty, so go with me here. But, but let's just imagine, let's re-envision this. So a woman comes up. This is what a neo-Nazi looks like today. You notice there isn't any swastikas. Why? Well, because if there was a swastika, we would all know immediately that's evil, that's bad. This symbol, the little uh, bullseye kind of target circle with a cross through it, that's the symbol of white power. That's what the symbol looks like today. That's the symbol of evil today. It doesn't have big, huge, I'm evil signs on it. It has pride on it. Something that we can get behind. Something maybe not so evil. So imagine this neo-Nazi. She comes up to Jesus. No, no, not the, the white Jesus. Do you have a real looking Jesus? That one. The one that would have a difficult time getting through TSA. You remember, you remember Jesus was a Middle Eastern Jew, right? Yeah, yeah, Jesus is the one that gets strip searched every time he comes into the country. Okay, so... This neo-Nazi woman comes up to talk to Jesus, and she says, hey, I need your help. But she never even got to that point, because Jesus has bouncers, and they pushed her back way before he even got an opportunity to talk to her. Why? Because she's a Nazi. She's a hate monger. This Nazi isn't going to have anything to do with this Jew, except for maybe to cause trouble. So when she comes up to him, his disciples do what they would naturally do, which is push her off. Get out of here. What are you doing here? And she says, well, I just, I just wanted to talk. And Jesus says, well, let her in. Jesus says, what do you want? I'm just trying to love on people. Why are you coming to make trouble? She says, look, I don't know if yours is the way, Jesus, but I have heard you are something special. And I just wanted to take little baby step. Maybe yours is the way, and I wanted to see, I wanted to change my way. And Jesus says, well, good. I'll show you the way. I'll give you the life. And he says, look, if you're asking for God, if you're looking for God, if you're knocking on doors trying to find God, you will receive him. And for us, what does that mean? It means that when we encounter somebody in our life that doesn't look like maybe we think they should look, Maybe we shouldn't look at how they look. 
It means if somebody comes to worship with us, that we shouldn't say, hey, maybe you need to look like us. Imagine what that woman, that that neo-Nazi woman or the Canaanite woman, the real story, imagine what her life was like after she encountered Jesus. Totally changed. Imagine what it would have looked like if she went to go try and meet Jesus and they pushed her away. She would have been all kinds of indignant. In fact, she would have had proof. Her entire life as a neo-Nazi, she would have been saying, ah, those Jews and they're evil and they're all kinds of hypocritical. And she went to go talk to Jesus. And you know what happened? She got pushed away. Everything everybody's ever told her about the situation was exactly what she experienced. She would have been hardened, calcified, made in concrete because she would have known for sure. Aha, I knew it. I put my foot out there. I exposed myself and they turned me away. Imagine if somebody comes into our setting comes to find Jesus into our environment and nobody says hi. I'm convinced that apathy is even worse than hate. Imagine somebody comes in here and you know they've they've lived life that they're they're not proud of and they're just trying to take baby steps and we look at them and maybe we can even smell them and we don't want to say or do anything with them. And they're going to leave. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to say all the things that they knew were right. I knew I should have come. I hear the Christians are hypocrites, and I know that that's the case. And I came, and I wanted just to just to experience a little love, and nobody even cared. Everything I've ever thought or th- experienced, it, it's all true. That's why we're the love, y'all. So that we might extend ourselves to people who are looking to find Jesus. That's why we have... Sunday school. Why do we put our kids in Sunday school? It's so that they might be brought up properly. Why do we have all these small groups? It's not because I think maybe you have nothing better to do with your day. It's so that we might build relationships. It's so that we might start the the, the spider web of relationships in our community so that you might be moved and transformed and made into the being that God has made you to be. And maybe you encounter somebody And they're looking to to be moved and transformed too. And now you have the tool. You can say, hey, are you in a small group? Come, join my small group. We've got room for another. Have you had a cookie? We have the best chocolate chip cookies. Let me get you a cookie. This thing that we do, this church, is not on accident. It's not so that we could go through the motions. It's so that we could be the love. Because there's a lot of people in the world who are the hate. If we don't go to be the love, to confront it, to say, no, that's not it. Yours is not the right way. There is only one way, and it leads to a cross. Then who's going to do that? If you don't come to somebody who looks like a hate mongerer and shows them love, they might never know love. If you don't come to somebody who's never had a hug and hug them, they might never have that. If you don't go up to somebody and tell them, Jesus loves you, and then don't go looking for something, but just share that wonderful, simple, beautiful message, somebody might never hear it. Or the next time they hear it, it might be in a setting that is completely different and hypocritical. We exist in the world for a purpose, and it is to be the love. That's why we have Sunday school to raise up our kids. That's why we have small groups so that we all might be changed. That we might go out and transform the world. And I want to I leave you with this one last little thing. Which is that just as love is learned and goodness is spread, hate is not a given. Hate is learned. And there are people who will teach the next generation. We are the force for good.